I'll let it run in. And then Tyler, um, Thibaut Polina will be joining from France. Uh, Perfect. Make him also allow him to share screen and uh, talk uh, because we'll be tag teaming. So you'll hear, see that. Sounds name. perfect. And my question is, if somebody gets, if I send somebody a Zoom link, oh, Fabian is here too. Perfect. Can you also make Fabian uh, as another person who can share slides and can share screen and can talk? Uh, Sounds yeah. good. Just did that. I see Elena is here. Emmanuel is here. Oh, that's fantastic. A lot of our ocean mentors are here. I was a little worried that I'll have to carry the torch for too many people. Uh, let me check if Thibaut is on the line. We'll just wait. The first few minutes while we wait, uh, we often do a little bit of chit chat. So on the chit chat, I see uh, uh, Zach is back. Uh, seems like Zach, you have healed and recovered, hopefully. Uh, uh, let's do a quick round of intros for the new mentors that just joined today. Uh, so I see Fabian. Yeah, Fabian, could you just briefly introduce yourself and your background and interests? Okay, so I'm uh, Fabian Bar, and I'm from southern France. Uh, my, my background, uh, well, you see it, right? <laughs> uh, it, it's mostly about uh, plankton, uh, but I like plankton when it's big and gelatinous. Uh, that don't mean that I don't like small plankton, but well. Uh, and technically, I started my career carrying experiments on ecophysiology of zooplankton mostly, and more and more, I'm doing quantitative imaging uh, at large scale. Uh, I've been quite involved in uh, different Tara Ocean crews. Uh, collecting plankton, finding ways to collect plankton with a lot of constraints, uh, including not stopping a boat. So trying to collect fragile animals while cruising at high speed is always a challenge. Uh, and, uh, and that's about all, which is quite already. And then can you say a word or two about Villefranche? Yeah, so Villefranche-sur-Mer, so that's where I, I study. Villefranche-sur-Mer is one of the lab of Sorbonne University. So it's Southern France on the Med Sea. So basically it's five kilometers away from Nice. Uh, and it's pretty sunny usually, except the few days before uh, where we got some massive draw. Um, but usually you can go at sea by kayak or by a little boat and there is no continental slope which means that basically in the Bay of Villefranche we have plankton from the open sea and we can get at sea 350 days a year which is not too bad. <laughs> yeah and I you know I think many of the things as we discuss the challenges of uh studying and the importance of studying the ocean in the last class. We will continue that theme, but today focus on solutions and a very unique uh, team that's been working on a breadth of solutions. But access to the ocean by itself is a challenge because to stretch your imagination and understand what needs to be done, you really first have to have access to the ocean, which we will talk a little bit about today. Uh, any new mentors that join? Yeah, Anna. Would you mind just briefly introducing yourself? Tyler has the tough task of identifying. This is Anna Odin. Yes. Briefly. Hello, everyone. I'm Anna, and I'm also part of the Plant on Planet project with the, together with Fabian and Manu and Thibault. I don't know whether he's already around. And I'm a microscopist, but a super resolution microscopist, so nothing you can really do on the sea because we need really very, very stable uh, conditions. But I'm a sailor as well. And so when I got in touch with um, the Tara Foundation project and the Plant on Planet project, uh, well, I was very curious about what they do. And I discovered with them all the possibilities of the uh, citizen science, which is something I find extremely interesting uh, nowadays, extremely exciting. So I'm part of the adventure together with them. Uh, thanks, Anna. 
Uh, and then Thibaut, when you join in, uh, you can ping me uh, via chat so you could do a quick intro. So what we'll try to do today is uh, spend some time on uh, technological solutions and thinking about how to continuing the theme of the last case study that we started, which was around measuring the planet. The first half of that is focused on the ocean. And starting next week, we will move into our Starting Thursday, we'll move into terrestrial ecosystems and be thinking about rainforests and measuring ecosystems on a terrestrial context. But today is primarily going to be focused in the ocean. Uh, just brief set of logistics before we dive in into the content. Uh, and uh, the thread there would be is focused on the idea board and the teams. Uh, I think uh, we have spoken to a few of you and thinking about the logistics of building teams. This is a large scale effort of uh, 100, 120 people across the planet trying to work together. So you should not be surprised by logistical challenges of finding time to talk to each other, but it's worth it. So in the end, uh, it is valuable to take the time, uh, introduce yourself, join one team. And I wanted to just say a word about it. Although you might be excited about multiple ideas, it is extremely important that you commit to one team because if you're committed to multiple teams and it's perfectly okay, I mean, in real life, there are also challenges in finding solutions. Not everything works out. The purpose of this is for you to experience the process of going from a problem to a solution in a short period of time. So commit to a set of teams. I think Tyler, you were thinking about a deadline for committing to teams, right? What was the deadline in mind? Do you wanna say a word or two about team building? And then we'll transition sure. to the topic for today. Yeah, sounds good. Can you hear me well? Okay, perfect. Yeah, so I, I think Manu put it perfectly. Um, yeah, we really do think it's very important that like the goal of this is to have, you know, choosing, choosing one team, it's really a chance to practice going deep onto one, one idea. This doesn't have to be the perfect team that's going to solve every problem in the world. This is really a chance for you just to go in and, and really characterize a problem deeply. So it is important that you choose one. Um, we're hoping this week is a chance for you. I know some people have joined multiple teams. Um, this week is a chance to sort of get to know those various teams, see how they're, you know, they're, they're getting started with, with uh, refining their idea boards. Um, and then by end of this week, so by Friday, we're hoping to have everyone um, have committed to their main, their main team that they want to work on, the, the one that is going to be their final project team. Um, because on Tuesday, we can talk later, but on Tuesday, we're going to have the first uh, sort of little deliverable for, for the teams. Um, so by the end of this week, we should have finalized uh, which final team you want to work on. So the, the drop dead deadline for choosing a team is Friday. <laughs> That's kind of the, and I think at this point, we have checked in the Discord I already see almost uh, 30 or so teams have been formed. Uh, and I think it would be very valuable that uh, if you're kind of on the edge, choose one thing and go for it. Uh, okay, so let's dive in into uh, sort of the today's topic. And I wanna bring it back to where Emmanuel and Lee left last time. And I'm going to share my screen briefly. Um, Uh, so I think this is where I want to start today. We will do a very uh, kind of a broader view in thinking about uh, the set of challenges that we had discussed last time. So we're still focused on the case study three with measuring the planet. Here are two websites that you can write down that are useful for the context and the background for this uh, uh, get together. Uh, and I think Anna and Fabian, I'm assuming Coleman is not here. The way I was thinking of running this would be is I have the P2 slide deck. Uh, I'll go through and set up a little bit of a background of how people got together. And then Fabian, uh, either I can drive the slide deck and I can ask you to talk about the specific slides, especially focused on the history of Tara as well. I want people to have a little bit of a background of Tara because people have heard that term, but nobody really knows. Uh, so we'll just tag team along and then I can take a few sets of slides, but of course uh, chime in and I'll kind of put you on the spot Fabian most of the time on those stuff. And then 
uh, if Columban and Emmanuel is also on the line, we can all share the burden of walking through. I want this to be kind of an interactive discussion rather than just a monologue. Okay, um, great. So let me begin sort of with the background of how I got involved uh, in uh, with this team of, uh, the team is called Plankton Planet. Uh, it was primarily formed around the ideas of measuring the ocean. Uh, all the people that are involved are not listed here, uh, but we all got together in New Zealand in 2017, thinking a little bit about what can we do for the ocean from a large scale sampling perspective? And we'll spend a few minutes uh, describing the set of challenges and the set of technical details for why it's important to sample the ocean. And then in the very end, also talk a lot about the social structure that Anna and uh, the Tara Foundation and many folks are trying to build around this such that the tools that we make are actually used by people. So, Sort of, I think, let me just read this as a vision because I find this vision very inspiring. Uh, this is a group of academics, sailors, citizens, and mariners and artists that have come together. Uh, and uh, the vision primarily is to harness the creativity of mariners, scientists, and makers for global evaluation of ocean health, biodiversity, and evolution. Uh, and when we were starting to build this organization, and I think everybody else that is part can chime in, uh, the graph that you see on the right, it was extremely important uh, that everybody that we are bringing to the table has an equal voice in this framework. So not everybody in P2 is a scientist per se, and makers have an equivalent uh, framework. And I know many of you are makers and you would describe yourself as inventors first, and scientists later. And I think it was very important in the organization for us to make sure that that has an equal standing because of course scientists can bring a lot of questions to the table, but sometimes the set of creativity. And then the other part of this is if we are talking about the ocean, the mariners hold the kind of knowledge which is context dependent that is really hard to find otherwise. And it's very important that these mariners go beyond what we would describe as oceanographers who would study the ocean. And I think when we discuss the, with Liz in next week, when we talk about terrestrial ecosystems, you will see a very similar framework building where folks that live in rainforests have an equal say in starting to define uh, what, what are the sets of problems we're trying to solve. And at the heart of it, and I think this was a very uh, deliberate act of adding artists right in the middle primarily because as you will see very quickly, plankton are incredibly beautiful. And I think for most of conservation efforts, I find that the aesthetics of that is extremely important to put in the table. So I think for many of you who are starting to think about these problems, think about this structure per se. Uh, let me jump to now a little bit on the kind of the the technical side of this. I think much of this was covered, so I'm going to skip to really get to data, but much of this was covered by Emmanuel before. Uh, of course, uh, why studying the ocean and the fact that this uh, aquatic ecosystem is what makes us unique to begin with. So even though I'm curious how many of you are landlocked and how many of you have never experienced the ocean, uh, if you want to poll and write in the chat, uh, but it's actually an extremely important and integral part of what makes life on this planet work. Uh, and I think we covered much of this last week with Emmanuel. So let me just skip most of this. Uh, yeah, maybe Fabian, I was curious if you want to comment on uh, the plot on the very left. I find that both inspiring and puzzling in many ways on the history of observations in the ocean and the fluctuations around that, or maybe Emmanuel or any other oceanographer that's on the call, uh, could you comment on the fluctuations around the number of observations as a period of time, and especially the worrisome decline in number of observations that I see? Well, uh, it came from several things. The first of all, came f the, 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 it came from the data set itself, uh, which is the NOAA copepod where they actually try to assemble whatever was already digitalized, uh, which means that 
whatever crews uh, don't have a digital copy somewhere, uh, it's kind of complicated. Uh, secondly, if you look whatever happens in science before, uh, I would say at the end of World War II, everything was very concentrated on a country per country uh, level and published on a country per country basis, which means that they were not international journals. So that are very hard to actually locate. I know some of those data that actually are not in Copepoda that I know where to find in French journal from ancient age. <laughs> um, so that, that's the first thing. Secondly, the, there is a current tr trend in going less and less to biology in, uh, in oceanic cruises, uh, which means that the more it, the time is running, the more we are focusing on physics because you can get sensors. It's easy to get a sensor that works uh, to acquire data. As mm -hmm. soon as you get to biology, well, it requires a huge human effort to actually look for the sample and get the sample to a data level. Mm -hmm. And that's why there is that decrease in, uh, in time. Mm -hmm. For the drop in the 70s, I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Emmanuel or anybody else wants to comment on this plot? Uh, I know Elena is also on the line or anybody else. Uh, I, find it, I find it interesting because if you look at and compare it to DNA sequences and things, and I think this is at the heart of what does it mean to measure the planet? What does it mean to measure biology on the planet? is should we just sequence everything and is that enough? And I think what I find ironic quite literally is in the older age, and of course, before the era of uh, genomic sequencing, imaging was the primary tool that was used to see the, uh, you know, taking photographs and taking microscopy was at the heart of observation. And at this point, sequencing has flipped that, that we, we have more, photo. yeah, we or photographs. <laughs> No, yeah. no, no, no photos, just counting on the microscope. That's correct. That's correct. Actually, no photos. No photos was, drawing was a requirement for you to be a biologist. Now we have flipped that around that we have sequences that you can gather, uh, which we have absolutely no idea what the morphology of that organism might be. And we have the potential now to change that and bring that balance back where of course the genomic information can teach us a lot, but without the phenotype and without what organisms look like, it's very hard to understand them. So this is one challenge uh, that is relevant from the ocean perspective that I want all of you to be thinking about. So I'm gonna go a little bit can I, fast. Yes, go ahead. Can I comment? I think it's also Absolutely. a problem that countries are invested a lot in technologies but they have forgotten about taxonomists. <laughs> so they are not putting money to hire people. So it's easier to get sample uh, like hydrographic data with machines, but mm -hmm. it's not so simple to identify the organism. And it's mm -hmm. more expensive as well. So. Mm -hmm. And I think this is at the heart of, I know there is one idea board that we all created about taxonomy and machine learning and especially the interaction between classically trained taxonomists and machine learning tools. It's not either or, and I know many of the teams that are proposing machine learning solutions, it's very important to understand how to, the kind of time-aged wisdom that a taxonomist builds is extremely important. And you know, how do you bring them in that picture in the same framework? And I know Ecotaxa has, uh, Fabian, can you describe how Ecotaxa has been able to bring sort of digital technology and classical taxonomists to the table? Was there resistance from taxonomists, for example, to use uh, a tool like that? Yeah, so just, just, I don't know if you know Ecotaxa. I will take the, uh, the pari that no. Ecotaxa is basically a, a kind of imaging database uh, where actually you can collect uh, plankton samples, digitalize all of them, uh, and then put every images uh, that you get in your sample in that database. And every images is basically visible for anybody 
if the data owner click on the little things which is actually already clicked when you create a project, which means that you need to make the effort to make your data not available to people. Um, and, and that tool actually was made to simplify your life because we all need to validate images and I'm facing days and days of images that I have no clue about what it is, new plankton that I've never seen before and things like that. And the, uh, the reality is that taxonomic knowledge became scarcer and scarcer, which means that, and, and that came from the fact that there is very few training for taxonomy and there is actually very few you need to accept on the bottom stuff. If you click accept on the bottom, or just go to explore image. And then you click on plankton scope or you search project plankton. Uh, not, not, not project, just plankton. And then you will find some planktoscope, Lorient, or Polina 20, well, well, the Polina 20, yes, that one, the second one, yep. And then you, you click on update view on Apply filters. On the top, on top, on top, on top, on top, here, here we are. And then if you go up to the page, there is, click on the dedicated page, uh, there, and then you will have the full access to the project, basically. Uh, so basically, that thing is actually meant to, uh, to help to find what is a plankton, uh, to explore image by yourself, to get the possibility to train yourself, seeing how a taxonomic guy is calling a copepod uh, and to look what that copepod looks like, then you may find that one in your data set and basically um, to, to share the knowledge and to actually get all the images that every taxonomist have uh, somewhere in some hard drive, actually on a website that everybody can consult and share. Yeah, and I think one thing that we should also compare to uh, Ecotaxa, which has similar uh, uh, structure to iNaturalist as well, which many of you might be used to seeing in which taxonomists work with people who upload data in these data sets. So taxonomists help verify some of the machine learning tools and some of the tools that are also just done by individuals. So there is a verification system that's also built in Ecotaxa. And we'll come back to Ecotaxa once we talk about plankton scope very specifically as well. Emmanuel want to say something? Yeah. Go ahead, Emmanuel. Just to mention that the, one of the limitations you see in this data set is the ability to go to sea. The 70s were the oil embargo. And I will not be surprised that a lot ah. of were kept at home. And the same will happen with COVID. So yeah. when you're depending on, on a national fleet, you have the limitation of what that fleet can do and when it can go out or not in terms of yeah. collecting samples. Yeah. And I think, I mean, that's a phenomenal point because if we are going to be measuring the planet, the continuity of these data sets matter significantly. As Emmanuel had highlighted in the last class, the continuity allows us to learn something in a manner that when they get discontinued, so as we are thinking about solving frugal technologies for measuring the planet, the continuity of measurement matters. A simple measurement made over a very long period of time is remarkably valuable as compared to a, a very high fidelity measurement just made once a while. So as you're thinking about cost, this is the same thing you can apply to human health sometimes, that a long-term measurement amongst the health of a individual allows you to learn so much about that individual as compared to once a while a rare visit to the doctor. So this is sort of the doctor's visit for the planet. Okay, so let's keep going because we have a lot to cover. Uh, one thing that was brought uh, last time and I wanted to briefly talk about this because to me, this is personally my favorite instrument ever invented. It has its challenges as well. Uh, this is Sir Alistair Hardy and he was a remarkable individual and an inventor and an oceanographer. He invented a tremendous number of tools for measuring the planet. 
uh, from the ocean sense, but one of the ones that has continued and provides us data are these continuous plankton recorders, which is what you see on the top. They are currently deployed on many shipping vessels around the world. There is a piece of silk that passes through, and it's not silk as a material, I'm assuming, uh, but one of the things about this is uh, here is what the the track actually looks like. So if you look here, uh, this is the mesh. And uh, once this is dragged in into the ocean, as you can see, things are trapped in. And this is the kind of resolution of the data that you would get. So there are certain sets of challenges, although this has been a very valuable tool, uh, there are lots of challenges associated with what you can do from the taxonomic perspective with these data sets. But it is an inspiring example of programs like this running over a long period of time. And I think what is remarkable is the program was started in 1931 and it still continues still today. And in my mind, this would make it probably, I mean, in terms of thinking about a measurement like this in such a continuous fashion to be uh, competing with probably some of the longest time series that we have ever recorded at this resolution on the planet. Uh, so these time series become more and more valuable the longer they run. And so initiating projects like this is extremely valuable. Uh, and uh, the organizational structure that you create around measuring the planet is as important because seemingly whosoever started CPR when uh, the when Hardy was not there, the program continued out of Plymouth, and that was very important. And I think this is another important aspect for you all to think about. Uh, so let's keep going. Let's jump to Tara. Uh, Emmanuel, Fabian, could you guys give a, a brief, like a two-minute thing on Tara itself? You could walk through these pictures, for example. What is Tara? Fabian, you can go first. Uh, Emmanuel, you, you were Emmanuel, go ahead. the first one. Okay. Sir, yes. sir. T Tara is this amazing partnership, uh, public-private partnership that started with, with this foundation that acquired the boat and decided to give it to science, uh, to do science on, on, on global scales. And then uh, scientists that came with a vision to the foundation and said, we'd love to use it a bit doing what Darwin did in a sense, going all around the world and being able to do, by doing exactly the same measurements everywhere, the data is gonna be comparable, which is a big problem nowadays and it's been forever, that when you use, uh, when different people go to sea, they go for a month, the methods are not necessarily fully comparable and then you cannot, you cannot take a sample that's collected in South America and compare it with Asia and and know that it was done exactly the same way, whether it's genetic, whether it's imaging, whether it's with nets, there's, there's subtle differences that makes it not comparable. And this cross comparability, even, there's, even if the methods as issues, makes it much more useful than if it's different because one person you know, does it with a different mesh and one person does it in, in another way. What's beautiful with Tara also is it, it has scientists spanning the world over from Japan um, to France, to the US, to Spain, Italy, a whole bunch of people that really believe in it because it takes a tremendous amount of effort to be part of it. So you have to really believe uh, in it to, to make things happen. Uh, it's, it's, it's ran initially, um, the, the visionary was a cell biologist. He was a sailor, but not a marine scientist. Eric Garcenti, who had that vision about, uh, about it, and then slowly, slowly attracted people around that vision that were willing to go to their own country's uh, science uh, institution and ask for money to do it. So the foundation provide the, the ship, provide the crew, there's a cook on board, there's 14 people, but there's only five scientists. There's always a journalist as well to, to make the media part about it and to sell it to the bigger world by why it's important. The IOC, the International Oceanographic Commission at, the U, at UNESCO is a partner in it. And the idea is really to excite the world about it, but to make all these really important measurement in a, in a, in a comparative way. I, I, the way I call Tara is the little boat that could, 
you know, uh, <laughs> there's a book for kids about the little train that could, because it really showed all the big nations that have multi-million dollars boats and everything, how things could be done with much less money, but it can provide so much more in terms of ability to intercompare and over time intercompare. Tara, um, this first mission for plankton started in 2009, and now there's a plan for the next one that's gonna leave next year. And it, the, the, the protocols are gonna be the same for the same measurement, even if some measurements are added on the side afterwards. Yeah, and I think the, the idea that it's a sailboat from a, a ecological standpoint, do you want to highlight that, Emmanuel? Just how much fuel does a regular boat take, a research well, vessel? It's, or just... it's not, it's, well, it doesn't always sell. In the Arctic, we that's went correct. against the wind, so we don't always sell, but, but it's a much quieter boat. And that's also an issue, particularly for people doing acoustic measurement. You want to work in as quiet and as least intrusive boat as you can compared to these giant science factories that I, that I go <laughs> on otherwise. That, that, that makes a lot of noise, noise pollution and other pollution. But yeah, they're trying to sail. The sailing world is also a very exciting, different world. They're, they're more rebellious. These are people that left land behind and went to sea. And a lot of the mariners on boards are like this, people that decided to drop out of school or after they finish school decide, I don't want to be in an office all day long. I want to be at sea. <laughs> but they're also, but they're extremely intelligent, extremely smart, and contribute a lot in terms of providing opinions about how we may want to do things differently because it's much more efficient to do it differently this way. They're, all of them are makers because when you're on a boat, sailors have to be makers. They break stuff. They have to improvise continuously. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I think they're adventurers, and they don't yeah. take no for an answer because they have they're survivors. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so let's keep going. I think, uh, yeah, maybe Fabian, I'll let you take this. The sets of technologies that have been used on Tara, maybe? Yeah, so Brief as Emmanuel have, have tell, basically we, we try to apply always the same technology, but we also try to capture the most of the plankton that we can, uh, which means basically we focus it from viruses, so below 0 0.2 micron in size, to big jellyfishes about 10 centimeters to a little bit more but not too more too much so basically that's the same differences in size in between a hunt and a brontosaurus okay <laughs> so the idea was to try to capture all that range of size in between a hunt and a brontosaurus uh, so that we needed different nets different capture devices um, and to study all that using both images, so quantitative images. So basically we try to image whatever organism is in there. So of course you cannot take the same picture of a hunt and a brontosaurus, so we needed to change cameras. Uh, and the same for the, uh, the, the DNA, because we wanted to focus on what kind of DNA from barcoding, so basically who is there, to the genome and transcriptome, what genes are there, what genes are active uh, for all that scale of organism. Uh, so that, that was the aim and we continue to do that, uh, basically that scheme of sampling, whatever the cruise is, we try to get both DNA, RNA and so on, and images at large scale, uh, the way we can, because sometimes we have some strong constraints. We've, we've been both involved, Emmanuel and myself, on another cruise, which is Taha Pacific, where basically we apply the same protocol, but we've got a very strong limitation that the cruise plan was already planned. So there were no extra time to stop the boat. So we needed to do all that full speed while cruising. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and i think we'll try solving that problem in a little bit so i'm realizing the time so i'm going to go a little bit faster here because i want to spend a lot of time on plankton planet and what we are trying to do as well so uh and i'll make this slide deck accessible so people can read through these sets of details and i think you know what is fair to say is tara has truly taught the world in many ways just from its impact in publications the amount of open data 
that community-driven science done on a shoestring is feasible. Any country in the world, I mean, again, this is a conjecture that I'm making, and maybe people can correct me on this. As long as you build partnerships, any country in the world can actually have a marine science program going at sea. Uh, you know, because just if you look at from a country perspective, the amount of investment that it would make would be fairly small. So I want to highlight the point that Emmanuel made that and I know many of you are joining from around the world and, you know, especially say looking at India and the massive uh, ocean coast that we have. I mean, there should be hundreds of programs like Tara. And my hope is that what we have learned from Tara would allow us to initiate hundreds of official programs like that, following up these same sets of protocols, because what it has shown is so much science can be done with so little. And I think, you know, that is something of a message to take on forward as well uh, to expand these programs. Okay, so, you know, here is, there is a lot of science that has been done. So I already said that. Uh, so let me skip to now back to Plankton Planet and what is different about Plankton Planet and how are we trying to expand the mission of Tara, but to individuals around the world. Uh, and I think this really comes from the idea, as Emmanuel had pointed out before, that the ocean is a dynamic place. So not only do we need to make a few sets of measurements, we need to be making measurements much more continuously. So although what you learned in Tara was really valuable in terms of these expeditions, they're still spaced apart a year or so, and the expedition doesn't go exactly to the same place. So how do we make continuous monitoring of the ocean possible? And that was at the heart of initiating and thinking about Plankton Planet. Uh, and again, you know, I think you should think of this really as what satellites and many other things allow us to do at the highest resolution in a dynamic manner. Can we do that with the biology in the ocean? Uh, and this was the heart of what led to Plankton Planet. And uh, Columban, who was going to join the call, unfortunately couldn't make it. It's too late. Uh, but I think what I love about this picture on the left is, uh, you know, if you look at thousands of citizen science, citizen sailing boats that are out there, either professional sailing yachts. And I know some of you in the call already have your own boats, Fabian and a couple other people, just for recreational purposes. The, the vision is what if those boats could be transformed to be little tiny science labs? What does it mean for the people? What does it mean for the tools that we can provide? And what does it mean for a scientific community built around using sailboats? So, there is roughly also around 50,000 cargo ships that are on the right, fishing vessels. And of course, many of these are uh, part of the problem, but they all also want to be part of the solution as well. I mean, shipping cargo, uh, cargo ships, I mean, we all cannot absolve ourselves from the fact that we are responsible for much of the traffic in the ocean because we love ordering stuff we want uh, all this global supply chains and global supply chains are completely dependent on cargo ships. So the goal is to be thinking about this as a community and what can actually be done. Uh, this was the start of uh, the Plankton Planet program. Uh, Fabia, Emmanuel, any of you want to sort of start the phase one uh, briefly how it got started? Yeah, well, the, the idea was to basically try to reproduce what was done uh, at the level of Tara, but of course, without all the uh, very fancy stuff that was just unreachable when you want to scale it up. So basically, one of the big costs of uh, analysis chains uh, comes not necessarily from the meta barcoding, but from when you want to access to metagenomic or metatranscriptomic, which are very expensive to uh, maintain and then analyze. And more importantly, if you want to, uh, to, to preserve the sample, uh, then you need some uh, liquid nitrogen or to freeze the samples or things like that, which is much of the time not feasible. Uh, but if you want to focus on meta barcoding, what plankton is there basically, uh, you don't need to invest in very crude way of preserving the sample, you just need to dry it. Uh, and basically here, the idea was to basically adapt the way we were sampling the, the plankton and just dry the sample on a, a, a cooking 
<laughs> pan, right? So we just put the filter on the aluminum foil that you see there and we dry the sample. And then you put the sample in a plastic bag and then it's gone. You send it to France and then we analyze the sample after that. Um, that was the initial idea of Plankton Planet. And what was very valuable was a simple processing technique that allows the same quality data, for example. Um, and then do you want to say a word or two about the, the first uh, series of what we call citizen scientists? Go ahead, Emmanuel. Yeah, yeah. I just want to add one thing because I think it's something important for people here. This is really uh, an idea that span out of the head of Colombon de Vargas. Yeah. Just like the Tara came with Carcenti. It's you, you can see here that individual matter. It does matter that an individual come with an ID and then is able to gel a team around them that's willing to have push that vision forward. Mm -hmm. So there's the importance of visionaries and the importance of them being able to congeal a team behind their visions and, and people that are willing to stand behind them and help push it. And, and you know, and, and, and in, the, in this case, we also saw uh, Sarah Romac who works as a technician for, for uh, Colombo. So it, it's really important to, to have a vision, have this individual and have a team around them that's willing to help push that vision. And that's, and that's a lesson for all makers uh, mm -hmm. in terms of doing. Mm -hmm. and, and in this case, they also, uh, Colombo was able to, to connect with yachties from all around the world to whom he could send then the pack with the with the different sen sensors and and the and the, uh, the little plankton net, and have them do it. And they done it with their kids on board. It was it became a whole community that was. Some of them did a lot of samples. Some of them did less. But the, the yachts themselves that were involved were very excited to add value to their sailing around the world. And that's and that's another thing with citizen science is it's not just that they're helping us, they're helping themselves. They give more meaning to the activity they're engaged in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I wanna emphasize the social side of this story, both in the designing the program and I think Columban's effort in both coming up with this, but then also making sure that a team that gets put together to really scale the vision for this as well. So as many of you are thinking about your own projects, remember this, that of course the idea originates somewhere, but really the ones that succeed are the ones that have the capacity to truly envision and realize what is needed to execute and bring others to that vision. And I think the reason I also chose Plankton Planet as a discussion rather than a specific technology, we all that are part of Plankton Planet are developing specific technologies, but frankly, the most important technology is community building. And Plankton Planet reminds me of that as an example of how welcoming this community has been for individual contributors. And as you are envisioning, because the purpose of this class is to solve global problems and have the kind of impact that we envision that will truly make change. And that we all know that none of us can do that alone, but it requires the importance of individuals comes from the fact that they are they are thinking about the large scale, but they are welcoming in a manner that truly opens up that every other person that would step on would really feel ownership of the project. And in the very last case study, when we talk about full scope, we will also talk about a similar idea of making sure that the ownership had passed. So many of these sailors, as Emmanuel said, truly feel and believe, and it's true, that they themselves are part of this entire cohort. They are not unlike many programs that I'm a little bit critical of citizen science when it comes to that you have to open a screen and citizens have to just click and tell, I mean, that's the type of stuff when you're trying to just analyze an image. And of course it's useful, but not to the same level of extent when these individuals are really putting, I mean, many of them are putting their life on the line to be where they want to be, to be able to contribute these data sets. So yeah, very important point, Emmanuel, on the community side. Uh, since we're going to run out of time, maybe let's do this uh, very briefly. Uh, one of the threads is this was the phase one of the program uh, that demonstrated, and I think I'll link the paper so everybody should read uh, the paper that Columban and the team has now put together on what we were able to achieve in phase one. Uh, 
Uh, all of that is documented. And I think in one line, I can summarize that uh, the quality of data that was collected by these individual boats now starts to match what something like Tara could do, but except they're in the water all the time, while Tara is only one boat, now you can multiply. And then the next phase is if we could do this with a thousand boats, what would that mean for measuring the planet? So uh, much of this is described in that paper. I'm going to skip this. I want to get to tools and technologies. Uh, so there are uh, several technologies that uh, we have all been building together to be for phase two, for how do we turn these little boats into uh, meccas of uh, science. And I think the idea is that, of course, we have started with few technologies, but any new technologies that would come about can be adopted into the program itself and including many ideas that many of you might be working on. So I wanna start with the high-speed net as a, so maybe Fabian, you wanna take five minutes. Uh, I don't know if you have another slide deck that you might want to show. It's a very clean technical problem and has a very beautiful solution. Uh, yeah, the, the, the program was basically if you want to use a normal net, then you nearly have to stop the boat. So during the phase one... Fabian, can you say a word or two about of what a plankton net is? Because yeah. as a so, technology uh, itself, it might be, uh, people might not have used it before. So a, a plankton net is something kind of very simple uh, in a way that you we use the um, same tissue that we use to actually filter floor. So basically uh, that's, that's a tissue where you have a mesh which is very nicely calibrated. So you have a ring that allows to open the net. And then at the end, we have what we call a codon, which is basically a little bottle where actually all the plankton uh, get concentrated at the end. Uh, the, the problem is that we can make those plankton toes, those plankton nets with pretty uh, a large variety of silk from very fine, we can go down to five micron if we want, to something like one to two micron, the two millimeter, sorry. But the more fine silk we want to use, the more fragile they are which means that if you want to sample some small plankton, phytoplankton, the, the vegetal plankton, uh, then you need to have some nets, which is basically about 20 micron or something like that. And those nets usually, if you start to tow them at more than two knots, so basically that's the speed of a walking man, then the net is exploding in the water. Um, so basically what we were, uh, we, 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 we faced that problem for Tara Pacific, uh, trying to get some nets in the water uh, without exploding them. Uh, so we succeeded to make one uh, at 300 micron, which is a heavy 80, mi 80 kilograms of net. Uh, this is a very big beast. Uh, and, uh, and then from that, then we were embarked in, Tara, in a plankton planet to try to replicate that, but with finer mesh, 50 micron, and smaller nets that you can operate at whatever boat you, you, you want. So basically, uh, that's when I met uh, Manu in New Zealand. And two months after that, then I constructed that ugly stuff <laughs> uh, which is on the uh, on the right side, which basically I just go to the uh, normal uh, workshop, uh, taking some piece of PVC that you usually use for uh, for your toilets or whatever, and then basically made a proof of concept of what I wanted to obtain to just look if the principle were good. So basically, you have a water reducer that actually only accept a very small portion of the water, which is directly uh, deflated afterward. So basically it reduces the pressure in the net. And uh, if you- So I wanna uh, say a word about this. Uh, and actually Fabian, if you wanna share a slide deck also, you can do that yeah. too. I can okay. share my screen. So, uh, and then- I have, uh, I have yeah. one, yes. Yeah, Tyler, can you enable Fabian? I wanna say something I, I, that is a I little have bit- the ability, I guess. Yes. I have. It's a little bit counterintuitive to make a plankton net, to add a reducer to it, 
because you always think about people making larger and larger and larger nets. But this idea of pressure is very important because sailors don't want to slow down when they are sampling the ocean. So basically, that, that's a big beast that we've made for Tara Pacific. So you see that the same principle, very small moth, two wings in order that it stay at the surface, and then directly afterward, a deflector. And because we were too shy, uh, we decided that for smaller plankton, we preferred the net to be out of the water. So we just have a water acceptance by that with a peristatic pump that pumped the water in the net. Uh, and that little net basically is just, so that deflector, same principle, reduce the pressure in the net and, um, and because I thought that it was not enough, so if you have a very fine and fragile fi filter, you don't hang the filter uh, directly uh, without any support, so you support your filter. So actually what you have there is actually a double net. So I have a 300 micron mesh, which is supporting, serve as a coffee holder, a coffee filter holder for the real net, which is a 20 micron filter just ex helping that one to not explode. And uh, that stuff has been tested uh, on board Tara. So that just, you know, that's still a big boat. Sorry, there is sound. Okay, so basically just putting the stuff in the water, you see that the boat is full speed. You have the bigger net, which you see there at the bottom. So basically there is two nets in the water simultaneously and basically if you get plankton at the end then it looks like that. So the plankton is still moving. You see those bubbles that Noctiluca sentience or very fragile uh, plankton uh, which usually do photosynthesis, uh, bioluminescence uh, and basically the plankton is okay. So that was the idea. And uh, from that, then we switch it to more uh, precise plankton nets or more nice. And basically from the principle, no, the idea was to make it shiny. But the principle is exactly the same. A small mouth, double uh, mesh on the bottom, a weight to help it to, to sink. And uh, basically that's, that's the current nets. will stop sharing and uh, here. Yeah, and then I think uh, I was just monitoring the chat. There was a question about, uh, has Tara as yet been in the Arabian Gulf? Uh, and uh, then, yeah. In the Arabian Gulf, uh, yes, we were, uh, that, but we don't have that many samples because we needed to rush, that was in, 2009 or eight, uh, so, uh, nine. Uh, and basically uh, they, they were pirates uh, at that moment. Uh, we were escorted by some military boat uh, <laughs> and we just needed to rush. So no time for sampling uh, and things like that. And then the sampling started back uh, on the uh, Western coast of India uh, in the direction of the Maldives. So basically. So that's the samples that we have uh, there. Um, and then there was one more question on microplastics. Uh, so how often, both with the high speed side of the story and what has been done on microplastics in the Tara database? Um, so on the Tara Ocean database, the sampling was vertical, which means that there is very few chances that we've got plastics uh, in the samples that we've got. We have very few of them because plastic actually accumulate at the surface. And if you, uh, in what we call the great garbage patch, so you know, the, the plastic continents, uh, which is not really a continent, uh, which is not neither a patch, uh, they're just a higher concentration of plastic. And basically what you get there in that huge concentration of plastic is about one piece of plastic about the size of my inch, uh, of my, um, my inch, which is every four square meter. 
So basically, you, you can collect those plastic with plankton nets that are thrown at the surface. So with that high speed net that we've got, yes, we've got some nice amount of plastics, enough to start to map it, but, uh, but not from Tara Ocean. Um, okay, so we are now going to jump to talk about the second tool that we are developing in the context of the plankton side of the story. But before we do that, Anna, do you want to share a word or two about the uh, imaging side of the story? And I'm curious if I might have that deck on Seb's prior work on uh, efforts to try to do imaging on Tara, for example, and especially the, I know I have some data sets on the protocols on high throughput imaging on Tara. I don't know if Anna, you were engaged or involved in any of this work or wanna say a few words about prior efforts on imaging on boats and how difficult and challenging it is. Well, I, unfortunately, I wasn't involved in the Tara imaging but I remember Noan telling us stories about scientists learning to coordinate with the movement of the boat in order to <laughs> see if something pass in the microscope and shoot the picture at the right time. So this was one of the abilities that we were developing because, well, first of all, they were getting the binoculars in their eyes very often. <laughs> they learned to avoid and then they learned to see something appearing in the field of view and shoot at the right moment to get the images. That's yeah. something that uh, yeah. I still remember from his stories, but I wasn't there, so I cannot tell yeah. much. I'll, I'll cover some of the things that Seb did, but I mean, that's just such a beautiful example of what you really, you have to do this to be able to appreciate the kinds of problems because it's fairly easy. You could say, hey, let's just go to the store and buy a microscope and put it on. And anybody who has put anything in salt water knows how quickly everything just destructs, self-destructs yes. itself. So. I think I want to spend a few minutes uh, on how I met Columban and how this started. And I'm wondering whether Thibaut Polina, Thibaut, have you joined? Or I don't think Thibaut made it. Uh, Thibaut, if you're there, could you ping yourself on chat? And then Tyler, if you see Thibaut, you can uh, unmute him. Uh, I met Columban primarily and again in New Zealand uh, as the first time when the, as a community we started coming together. Uh, of course, we have done a lot of work in bringing microscopy to people, but in the past, it was always focused on terrestrial ecosystems. And I think historically, I just want to share one or two slides from Seb's work. Uh, of course, imaging has been an important aspect of history of uh, oceanography and ocean marine biology per se. Uh, and one of the things that has always been important is just how unusual these creatures are. There is a large number of tools and technologies that have been developed to do high throughput imaging, flow cytobots, flow cams. These are flow through high speed microscopes and they really cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that was the time that as a team, the Plankton Planet team, we decided to build a low cost imaging system, uh, which we now call Plankton Scope, which we've just published and it's openly accessible and people around the world are starting to build but I briefly want to describe the value of imaging before we jump in there. Uh, one of the aspects is, of course, uh, Tara had a high throughput imaging system that was placed. It's not always active, but it has been used from time to time. And one of the beautiful things that I want to just share before I start is Seb developed a class of protocols that allow you to label uh, many of the components out in the field and also in the lab to do confocal 3D imaging. Of course, that's not what we are doing with the low cost tools, but I just wanna share the value of 3D imaging. So these are the beautiful data sets that have come out of his work uh, in trying to enable, and this can be done with fixed samples, but you start realizing the complexity of these organisms that run the ocean. And ironically, the more and more we gather uh, one fascinating thing that emerged from these imaging data set is symbiosis is not an exception, but the rule. It's such a large amount of associations of organisms living with each other that makes the ocean work. Uh, and then the other aspect of this, what he was able to do, because all of this was 3D imaging, uh, they were also able to take these data sets and turn them into, so this is an example 
uh, for when you start doing epifluorescence and you sign coexistence and interactions between different organisms. And I'm just passing this through because this is beautiful imaging data set. I want you to just see and admire the images associated with this. Uh, some of these are probably the most remarkable cells that you know, I've ever seen in my life. Uh, but one of the fascinating things was here. This is again, the maker in Seb uh, came along in which they started thinking about 3D printing actual confocal data sets. And some of them were designed and modified from data sets. But what you're looking at in the right, and the first time I held one of these in my hands, it's a transformative experience because you are holding a cell, a diatom that produces you know, half the oxygen on this planet, but in your own hand at a magnification that you can feel and touch. And then of course, there was some amount of work that's also been done to build VR side of the story. But I know there are many 3D printing uh, uh, aficionados in this community, and it would be phenomenal to expand that. Many of these data sets are widely available. So any of you who are thinking about education, and I especially want to point out I know there is a team that's building around science education for the blind and for uh, visibly impaired. This would be a phenomenal uh, exercise to do for many of the folks who are involved in the education space to really see and 3D print a large cell and have a kid or a community explore it uh, without visual, but a sense of touch. So uh, remind me and I'll share these data sets uh, with folks if you're interested. And since I know many of you have phenomenal 3D printing uh, capabilities, it would actually be fantastic for many of you to engage. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna switch to talk just very briefly about uh, plankton scope, uh, maybe for 10 minutes. Uh, and then Emmanuel, I wanted to leave 10 minutes, uh, 10, 15 minutes for if you have time and wanna make the effort of also just describing other tools especially on the remote sensing and the apps that you've been developing as well, or anything you might want to cover. So I'll take 10 minutes now, and then we'll switch to kind of 10, 15 minutes on other tools. Uh, so for me, the, the problem that came about from a context of uh, the, what we call and ended up becoming a project called Plankton Scope, you can all go online and type planktonscope.org. Uh, this is an open source imaging tool that we've built. I often call this the big brother of Foldscope. Foldscope is a manual microscope that you collect data. This cost around $100, $150 to build, but all the plans of building this entire scope are all online. Any of you can build uh, and join the node of the community itself. And we're actually using this tool eventually not just for aquatic ecosystems, but for several healthcare applications as well. This is a very extensive website around the project. So I will go through the mission and what it took to build this, but a lot of details we have already released. So all of you will have access to it and then you can spend time through this website. Uh, so the idea sort of emerged from that uh, New Zealand meeting to be able to build, and I think in the New Zealand meeting, I had brought the first prototype version of this, which is literally this instrument. It is built out of optics parts, but it allows you to pour, and quite literally, Fabian had taken a plankton net, put it in a wine glass, and then when you see there are, you know, there could be somewhere around a million cells in it. And the challenge is how do you image those million cells in a rapid enough fashion such that you could still reconstruct uh, the aspects of uh, imaging that cannot be done manual. So this little falcon tube here, you pour that sample in. This is the very first sets of prototypes and you can see that they're all built out of sort of more conventional parts. There are pumps, there is some optics that I'll describe. But we quickly moved to testing this and we, this was a, a phenomenal collaboration with a sailor. And it became very important very early on for us to work with sailors. And Thibaut, who was in, living in France at that time, who's the lead on this project, joined my lab and actually spent several years in my lab going now back to France again. Uh, and the partnership was to ensure that when we are building something, we're actually deploying it. We had built several prototypes and we actually deployed these prototypes on a, a sailor 
that is very widely well known in France and might actually be very well known in around the world. Uh, his name is Gurek and he sails around the world uh, as an explorer and he was very kind to take all the tools. So this is a photograph from Gurek's boat before he left from San Francisco to the very right where you can see we had set up two or three and there are many lessons to be learned here. You can see a lot of loose parts in there. Uh, these are, you know, they are really prototypes, but it was important for us to deploy these prototypes. Uh, just a word about Gurek. This is a video that Gurek had sent me. Yeah, you forget about the chicken. So I'm just gonna play this just for you to understand who are these sailors that we are talking about. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and Gurek uh, sails with the chicken and uh, he explains it to me that the chicken is for the, the eggs, but uh, I think it's also company. <laughs> and this is all footage just taken by Gurek on his sailboat sailing around the world. And I think I'm spending the time sharing this to you just to emphasize the idea that we still have explorers amongst us. You know, I know all of us cannot be in the middle of nowhere all the time, but if we can enable adventurers and explorers to engage in science, we have the capacity to truly measure the planet. And if we forget these individuals and they are not in the mix of how you're designing solutions, your solutions will be in the hands of people that are just like you. And that will not solve the kinds of problems. So I think as you are thinking about, and again, emphasizing the point that when I had said, for all your teams, you need to be thinking about who your client is. So our client for this tool was someone like Gurek, who's going to truly stress test. Uh, we heard after six months of, because he goes out for 11 months at a time, after six months, his boat capsized and uh, he, I mean, he survived, the boat survived. We lost most of the data, but we learned some hard lessons of ensuring of how to build reliable tools uh, and ensuring uh, the capacity to be able to actually operate in fairly harsh conditions. And that led to, this is the data that he shared from one of his cruises. And so you can start seeing, this is the early prototype. We started getting some data sets. Uh, then we transitioned to building a modular system that could be repaired very quickly. Uh, this was the first version of Plankton Scope where every single module was separatable. So we could ship, if something breaks, we could ship certain sets of parts. Uh, one of the problems, although in, from a vision perspective, this was a really good idea on paper, there are too many parts. Uh, it's not so robust. So we're still continuing developing this modular microscope. But for the final deployment, uh, we're actually developing this as a monolithic system for it to be more robust. Now, this is the data that comes out of that uh, instrument that you just saw. This is flow through microscopy. There is a pump and you can see single cells in a bloom of a pyrocystis that's just passing through. This video is a little bit choppy. And so in 15 minutes, we could collect, say, somewhere of the order of, you know, you know 10 to 50,000 objects. And then of course, post that everything is post-processed and uh, in the context of machine learning, but the thread is this is the kind of data that we collect out of an instrument that cost us around $150 to build. Uh, this is another uh, example of when we deployed this with the fishing community in India. Uh, and one of the threads here that you will see is a pretty bare minimum boat. This is the earlier version of the plankton scope and you'll see it's operating on a car battery because we had no power source on this boat. So we stole a car battery from a general car that was there and we were able to operate the entire instrument uh, collecting data. And the interesting bit about this community is that these are some of the most traditional fishing communities in Lake Chilika in India. And many of these fishing communities are uh, at risk. And of course, Chilica is a World Heritage Site. So there is a lot of uh, uh, 
you know, there is a lots of challenges that Chilika faces because it is also a, a birding community, uh, one of the largest birding communities in India. Uh, and the power of being able to deploy these tools in hands of a community that has not been um, provided solutions before is really the heart of most of these projects. So of course there is the tool, but who is using the tool is far more important. Uh, this is some of the data that's already in the paper, so I won't talk about this too much. Uh, one of the aspects of this is Fabian and Thibault paired this data set one to one with a uh, flow cam and many of these tools that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I'm happy to say that we compete one-on-one -on -one with most of those data sets. And this is also the power, it reminds us the power of open source community and tool development that we can actually effectively com compete with traditional instruments that are built and designed with different norms in mind. Uh, I'm gonna skip here. So the point I wanted to make here was there is a lot of technical details on this that's in the document, but uh, I'll send this link and you should all take a look through this. And especially when you go in in the replicate section, it describes every little detail for how to actually construct the entire kit, what are the parts involved, every single piece that is actually needed to be able to build this entire instrument. And again, any of you who wants to use this instrument for your own projects uh, is welcome to. Uh, so I'm going to now jump back to the Plankton Planet side of the story again. Uh, so I described the two sets of tools, the high-speed nets, uh, the Plankton Planet, uh, the Plankton Scope. Uh, Anna, do you wanna describe just very briefly on the education side of the mission for Plankton Planet? And then I wanna jump to Emmanuel to briefly talk about sort of other frugal science tools in oceanography. Sure, you mean more about the curiosity? No, um, I, meant, I meant much more about sort of the, uh, okay. the importance of community engagement in a project. I think mm -hmm. just... So, I think in, in the past year, uh, we, we tried to communicate to the general public uh, the beauty of plankton. Um, so one of the idea was to create a plant and art uh, project where we could uh, put together the aesthetics of plant and all the scientific studies we're ma making it. So Noan, who is also uh, someone who has been involved in Tara and plant and plant for quite a while, now he he designed this plantonarium, so this dome that you see in the picture, <laughs> and uh, inside and outside there would be uh, beautiful. A photograph of plankton taken um, in particular by uh, Christian Sardet and I think uh, Noan himself and then inside also some 3D printed versions of, of uh, some types of plankton that Manu showed before so that you could really touch see and touch the, the plankton and along with this uh, we normally put in the center or close to it the instruments that we're developing and people can join and touch and use the instruments themselves and ask questions and experience and also give feedback because it's very useful for us to have their feedback to, to things that can be improved or changed. So that's, those are the moments where we really, uh, where the project takes all its meaning when we get in touch with other communities. Yeah, and I think uh, I wanna emphasize that it is all done actively. Much of the community engagement for any project doesn't happen passively. You really have to assign budget to it. You have to assign people to it. You have to assign enough bandwidth to be able to build a community around a project. So I think as many of you are thinking about projects and thinking about scaling those, it is an immense task and it's, there is an art to it as well. So I think it's very important to kind of spend the kind of time and effort uh, and bring especially the artists in the community itself. Uh, so I think we have maybe 10 minutes left. Emmanuel, I was thinking I want to pass to you for you to spend, I know 10 is not enough, but I wanted to spend a lot of time on Plankton Planet, but would you like to say a few more things, especially about other efforts? Uh, and, uh, you know, I think I'm also thinking in the, the remote sensing world. So I can stop sharing. And I know, Emmanuel, I put you on the spot. Yeah, I only no sent you that. Okay. No but 
Can That's I, why you can, you know, you can lean on your friends sometimes. And this is what I love about this class is, okay, this is really an informal discussion. Yes. Yeah. So I'll, I'll try and here, I'll, I'll get you on this. Let's see if I can, um, and I'll start. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Excellent. Oh, this is the wrong screen. Ah, it's not the one I wanted to show you. Ah. Uh, let me see if I can, it, the one I wanted to show you, let's see if I can. I just made a, a, a fast, uh, a, a fast one, a fast, uh, just got a few slides. Yeah, here it is. Okay, so I don't know how many of you are aware of this, this, uh, this thing. This is a Dutch invention where basically they use the phone as a, as a spectrophotometer and spectropolarimeter. So they had, uh, they wrote a paper in, in, it's really worthwhile looking at 2014, that's the, in GRL, in, with 3,200 citizen scientists, basically uh -huh. showing that they can use their phones to study aerosols in the sky by pointing in specific direction and by using a diffraction grading to basically turn something that has only RGB detectors into a hyperspectral sensor. Beautiful. Uh, unfortunately, and this is an issue with, with, with apps and citizen science, they got money one time, got this running, and then uh, couldn't man maintain it with new operating system for phones and things like this. And now they're, they got another injection of money and hopefully another one's gonna come out, <laughs> out of it. Uh, that, but, and this time they wanna also apply it to ocean. So the idea here is that, and this is what we do from space, we have satellites looking at the color of the ocean and from this trying to infer properties of what's in the water. And the more information we can bring in, if we can have polarized reflection from the ocean as well as, as um, unpolarized, we know more about what's in the water. Now I go to stuff we did in my lab. So I mentioned to you the first time I talked about the class that I do where students teach themselves everything. This is one of the projects that came out of the class, which is simply a chlorophyll fluorometer. Uh, the total price is, uh, the, the, it was published, total price of parts was $143. If you try and buy this sensor, it's ordered five or $6,000 from the manufacturer. We put them side by side on the dock. You couldn't tell the difference between them. Uh, and the student that's on it is now working in a sensing company in Sequoia Scientific in Washington <laughs> State. So, and he was a marine biology student. You know, he was not an engineering student. And that's part of the beauty. You get people sucked into it and they just get totally excited and, and do wonderful things. And you can use this fluorescence to also, if you wanted to, by probing in different wavelengths, you can do cyanobacteria, which is a different wavelength that what you, uh, excites uh, chlorophyll. You could look at uh, dissolved organic material. You could look at plastic with fluorescence. So it's, it's all an issue of excitation, different excitation emission, appropriate filters. You can have these sensors in water. Uh, another thing that the same student did for his master is an app to, rather than hyperspectral, which we, 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 we uh, did not want to do, we, we just use the phone as a light collector. And if you normalize measurement from the sky and measurement coming off the water, then can it become calibration independent. So the idea here, you use a, a gray card of known reflectance, you use water, you use the sky. This is a well-known method in oceanography where they do it from boats but this time using your phone and it gives you an RGB reflectance from which you can get um, to information about turbidity. Some people even uh, use it to uh, after they calibrate it to do chlorophyll in their water bodies. The same week we talked about the app, another group using this app showed how they use it with citizen scientists, independent of us completely, which was really fun. Uh, to date, it's now, this was two years ago, it was 1,400 downloads. Um, hopefully by now it's 3,000, whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. But you need a gray card. You need, you need a, a reference. And that's always an issue. Calibration is a major issue with science. And you want to use either calibration independent because you're measuring something you know, and that turns uh, your sensor into a relative measurement. This is something else we started doing recently with two students in my lab. Uh, basically taking scientific equipment, but running water through it as the boat runs through and using uh, Internet of Things tools and Raspberry Pis to, to get the data to every student on the vessel on their phone or on a tablet. So 
using common tools to make the data much, much more easily available. Uh, these sensors are not cheap, but they could be in, in essence. If you do them with Raspberry Pi, you use, you use the, the Wi-Fi tools on it or, or black uh, or um, yeah, uh, Wi-Fi tools and then pump it to anybody who wants to see it on the boat. And you can imagine in a cruise vessel where there's all these rich people paying a lot of money to go to sea, if they could see data, they could, you know, collect it on the boat, telling them, oh, look at the picture of plankton going through the, the boat as we're, as we're cruising around and drinking champagne, that could really add value to them beyond just uh, being at sea and playing cards. Anyway, so <laughs> these are the kind yeah. of things that, that I think can really excite people and reduce the cost of measuring, you know, getting measurements about, about things people care about that have to do with, with things in the ocean. So, yeah, absolutely. yeah, and I think I, I want to make a comment about what you said, Emmanuel, in the very end, which is very important, which is whose data is it and uh, who owns this data and how quickly can you share it and how many more people can look at it. So I think Emmanuel, the point that he made about the instrument in real time, uh, uh, essentially streaming and transmitting that data, because one challenge that we all face in large big data challenge is the fact that not enough people are looking at it. And, you know, I went to one or two cruises and then the data gets locked in and there's a whole protocol and after so many days and you've lost the context. It's like, oh, there was an event that happened or something that I passed through. So this idea of being thinking about not just the uh, tools for measuring the planet, but to be able to, in real time, make changes and adjustments in your measuring protocols is extremely important because sometimes there are rare events that we are looking for and how quickly can you adjust and do a feedback loop around, oh, this was something very interesting. Maybe we should put this other instrument out there. And how do you get more eyeballs on these data sets? Another, so I know many of you who think about uh, much more from a computer science framework, it's a very important problem. I mean, the fact that I can, anybody can do Facebook Live and stream massive amount of data, all the infrastructure for that exists, can we use that infrastructure in a scientific context? So I think it would be very valuable as you are all building and thinking about if any of you are making measurement tools to keep in mind the context of whose data is it and how do you share that and how do you not just lock it such that it sits somewhere in a single place, but is in, um, I mean, yeah, I think there are several ideas already around building uh, gaming infrastructures, for example, on it. I think Plankton Man Mania was a great example for a VR game associated with it, but it would be very valuable to think about not only just the collection of the data, but the consumption of that data by everyday individuals as well. Uh, so it's 1.53. I want to be uh, kind of, uh, thank you so much, Emmanuel. Uh, and this is the tip of the iceberg. I think one of the values is as you look through the mentors, look through the class of papers that they have all written in the past, and you will find a tremendous, and uh, we'll make sure, I think Taylor on the mentors page, let's make sure that their research papers, the websites are linked. That way people can find and discover these papers itself. We are doing, I think since we are jumping through so many topics, uh, you have to realize that you are hearing literally the tip of the iceberg of what exists under there. So make sure that every topic that we cut, touch, go and look back at some of the original papers. Um, maybe we'll leave five minutes for uh, brief discussions. And especially if there are teams currently already engaged in problems in the ocean, if they want to jump in and briefly share some of the idea boards with some of the new mentors that just joined. Um, I don't know, uh, do you know, Tyler, if there are certain teams that are primarily, say if there is a team that has formed around the microplastic uh, idea board, or I'm just curious if any of the teams that are working on the ocean context, or this is the floor is open, any questions people might have, just write in the chat or raise your hand. Uh, and we can just turn this into a conversation for the next 10 minutes. Perfect. Yeah, I know there are um, quite a few teams on ocean stuff. I think there's one on uh, detecting algae blooms, um, one on ocean biodiversity. 
uh, I think there was also microplastics as well. Yeah, so both actually, yeah, both microplastic filtration and detection. So any of those teams, feel free. Or anyone else, really. Yeah, any, any questions or just any discussions or anything that comes to mind that people wanted to cover? I know there was a lot of discussion that happened in the chat that we couldn't get to. And then again, since this is past the official time, we'll officially close the class and we'll just hang out for a few more minutes for, this is sort of the, at the end of the class, uh, lingering discussions that happen. So this is that time. Uh, but I'm just curious if anybody has any questions. You can raise your hand. Uh, I see Sheetal has a question. Uh, Sheetal, do you, do you wanna unmute Tyler? Hey, uh, so I just wanted to uh, ask about these uh, high-speed nets, uh, whether can they be also used to sample plankton at um, deep sea oceans, uh, and at what depth can they also be used? So Fabian, uh, you want to take that? So in, in terms of sampling of plankton, uh, we, we, we know how to sample plankton uh, very deep. Uh, there is some few sampling that are done to 3,000 meters or something like that. Wow. Uh, wow. The difficulty is actually when you want to sample that deep, uh, in those cases, you have no choice than stopping the, stopping the boat. So you mm -hmm. need to stop the boat and that won't be high speed anymore uh, because at 3,000 meters, uh, that mm -hmm. will be a huge okay. drag uh, from your plankton toe. Uh, so that that's possible. Usually, we 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 do that with what we call um, multi nets. Uh, so basically, when we do that kind of very deep cast, we have some special nets that have multiple nets right. attached together, right. and basically they open and close sequentially. So they are mounted on some rails. And basically, when we reach one depth, then one net is closed, and then the net, the, the, the net after is opened. And then we can get the plankton at different layer in the, in the sea. And I think I'll emphasize, uh, it was a joke that somebody told me, so I'm just repeating this. Uh, in the old days in oceanography, you had to invent your own, uh, the deep, a sampling bottle like the Neskin bottles that are used, unless you had invented one way of doing this, you were not a card carrying oceanographer. And so you should all look at the mechanisms that are used, absolutely beautiful mechanisms of bottles that you throw deep in the water and you th drop a weight. And when you drop a weight, only then does the bottle open and close. And then you drop the second weight to close it. The mechanics of it is just quite beautiful. And of course, they are very frugal because anybody can make them. Uh, and it would be right. really valuable for some of you to look at that technology. Those things are still fairly expensive when you buy them. Uh, but it's just the creativity around oceanography and the tools for the ocean is quite valuable. Uh, I think there is a question for you, Emmanuel, if you're still there, uh, by George uh, Nahas. Uh, do you want to unmute George, Tyler? This is... Uh, hi. Um, so, yeah, Emmanuel, regarding the use of the cell phones in the ocean as photospectrometers, uh, what is the general application of that? And uh, regarding algae blooms, I think there's generally some kind of color variance following these blooms. Yes. Has technology been like kind of so, used in that way or? So, so not, so the app we did, the idol color so which which is not what you need what you really want is this um, use this this Dutch app which required this attachments with which is currently not available supposedly very soon uh, from from the group in the Netherlands but the, but Emmanuel the, we can just build it <laughs> exactly I'd love you guys to build it so that's the whole point is so here is the thing we can just for the assignment for the ocean this week we all build it all of us. So, think, so uh, a diffraction grading, very cheap. Trivial. Trivial. Polarizer is pretty trivial. Yeah. Excellent. Let's build it. I'd love to see you guys. Do. <laughs> okay. Assignment number three is replicate that paper 
So can you just share that paper and we will all just Absolutely. replace it. Absolutely. And I think one of the ideas of about assignments is I'm trying to cover the breadth of skills. And this assignment will also be about how to read a paper and how to replicate results in a paper and the value of replication. Because when you replicate somebody's work, you realize it's not exactly what you read and how do you interpret and how do you critique? So I think we'll just make that as assignment number three. Excellent. I'll, I'll get you the, the link. Yeah. Um, any other question? Uh, so going back. Uh, oh, yeah. Puneet has a question. Uh, Puneet, can you unmute Puneet, Tyler? And then I have a very quick announcement that I'll make. Oh, Puneet, go ahead. Hey, yeah, I, I was just very curious about uh, the ocean currents, uh, like what kinds of ocean currents are there and if we can uh, place a stationary sensor over there and if we could uh, measure the biodiversity in that uh, ocean current, how useful would that be? So you're talking about instead of uh, sort of uh, a spatially located sensor that remains uh, grounded while the water just passes by, right? And then I think the other thing in that chat for the questions was, are plankton region specific? So one question, I think uh, Fabian, Emmanuel, I have an, uh, another sort of a thread on this, but uh, you know, the big question that always is, you know, are plankton ubiquitous and uh, or are they in region specific zones? I'll let, I'll let Fabian answer that. Yeah, Fabian, go <laughs> ahead for your favorite creatures. We all okay. have our favorite creatures and our theories no, about the, where the, they live. The, 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 there, is some, there is very few uh, type of plankton that are ubiquitous. Uh, that's not the majority. So there is some few that are. Uh, but most of the plankton is very restricted in what temperature they like, in how much food they need, in what environmental conditions they like, and sometimes they are even restricted by the fact that they need to be associated with the symbiont or not. Uh, so that there is a huge amount of, and most of the science that we are currently doing is actually trying to understand what is uh, controlling the presence and abundance of all those plankton species. And I think um, for microorganisms, there is an equivalent question you can ask, not just in the ocean, uh, but in, uh, I just sent the wrong link for the paper. Yeah, uh, apparently, yes. <laughs> uh, I thought I copied it. Uh, here it is. Oh, no. Okay, I, okay, I'll fix it. Um, there is an equivalent question that you can ask about, now I finally have it. Uh, about, uh, you know, even in aquatic ecosystems and in the context of microbiology in general, are all microbes everywhere is uh, truly an open question because of spore formation. So there are lots of microorganisms that can form spores. And even in the ocean, when a bloom ends, it doesn't mean that species has disappeared. Many a times they form a spore and they hide in the bottom of the ocean again to re-emerge after a certain time. And we really don't understand what are the sets of cues. And this is why uh, it's a very important question to ask of what single cells do in the ocean. And at some point of time, if people have interest, you can check out this website on a question like this that we've been working on. It's called gravitymachine.org, which is associated with building tools to understand behavior of plankton in the ocean at small scale. Um, okay, so I think we're already over time. Uh, the announcement I, I, I want to say, just to rebond on what you said, um, single cell organisms are not the, the only ones. Copepods, <laughs> yes. copepods are doing resistance eggs that you can revive after 300 years. 300? Yes. Oh, <laughs> that's amazing. That is amazing. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, I think, you know, it's, uh, that's another aspect of long-term monitoring, which is what life can we revive back from uh, long past. Uh, so the announcement is that uh, to make sure that everybody forms teams by uh, 
Friday. And then on Tuesday, we will have a special session, which will be next week, where all the teams will give a five minute pitch. We'll see depending on the teams and the amount of time about the project that you are choosing. And I will invite all the mentors. And this way, the mentors will be able to see the teams, see the pitches. So this will be really, really quick, kind of a three slide problem. Uh, what space of solution you're thinking about and what help you need to execute. Just three slides. But the goal is that the teams will form and they will put together and this would, uh, we would invite all the mentors and we would start assigning mentors to specific teams itself. So the deadline for that is Tuesday. So keep that in mind. So as you form teams on Friday and then for the very, how many case studies have we done, Tyler, now? Have we done three or four? Uh, we can you hear me? Sorry, my mic yes. changed. Um, I think this is the end of number three. Three. Okay. So next, uh, next case study that we will pick up will be on terrestrial ecosystems and measuring biodiversity, and much more with the angle of conservation, because I know many of you are working on that space, and I think Liz and Zuli, and we have several mentors that are really focused on that side of the story. Uh, so we will see you all on Thursday. Uh, but please form teams and thank you again for many of the folks, especially from individuals from France, because it's pretty late out there now, uh, to be able to join on a, on a dime's notice. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Fabian. And Thibaut is missing from action. So tell him to not worry about it. <laughs> uh, bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, Emmanuel. Thanks, Elena. Bye, everyone.